of Bloomberg Technology live from just outside the Steve Jobs Theater in Cupertino, California. Coming up in the next hour, Apple unveils a faster iPhone XS, a bigger XS Max, and a cheaper XR. But all the luxury prices, will they kickstart more growth for the $1 trillion tech giant? Some investors are, aren't convinced. Plus, Apple scores FDA approval for its updated watch, tricked out with progressive new health tracking features, and competitors flatline. And another day, another high-ranking executive departure at Tesla. This time, it's the VP of Worldwide Finance and Operations. Details on that ahead. But first, it's been a big day here at the Steve Jobs Theater in Cupertino, California, with Apple's latest major product announcements. But there were very few surprises. The company unveiled updates to the Apple Watch and the flagship iPhone, where it is tripling down on its upgrade to the iPhone X. The new models are named the XS, a larger version, the XS Max, plus an entry-level version, the XR. Our Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman was inside the theater. He revealed many of the details uh, before Apple did here today, and you were pretty much spot on about all of them. What were the biggest takeaways for you? So the biggest takeaways were three new phones, and expansion of the iPhone 10 and it feels like the past two years have been a two-year cycle so they started with one model with this new look last year and then expanded it to the rest of the line or most of the rest of the line this year with the 10s the 10x max as well as the 10r and those names are a little confusing to say yeah, they're getting longer and longer I can't keep track yeah they're very Android like this year so a, a little confusing but I think they'll catch on eventually so look not a huge design change what are the actual upgrades so I think if we step back and look at the history of the iPhone every year they've upgraded it this year must be the smallest most minimal year over year upgrade that they've ever done from one model to another so the differences between the iPhone 10 and the iPhone 10s are some of the slimmest year over year differences I've seen the casing is the same they basically added a gold color option a faster processor and some slight tweaks to the camera now so very you, minimal you got a hands-on look I got a hands-on look as well one of the things that struck me is that 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 cheapest model isn't that much different uh, um, you know, in, in terms of form factor to the to the middle model, and, and why would consumers buy that thousand dollar phone when they can get it for seven fifty? Right, that's really going to be the key for Apple. It's more strategy than new features this time around. So they're sort of blending the iPhone eight, with the iPhone ten, bringing the best of the iPhone ten to the cheaper iPhone eight design this year. And so, yeah, to your point, there's not a lot of differences. That's why I think at seven hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred and fifty dollars less than the iPhone ten's thousand dollar price point, the ten R will be a pretty good seller for them. That said, the big one, you know, I like a big screen, and it, and it felt light. Um, it's that price point, $1,100. You know, $1, Are people going to pay it? I think so. I think so. I mean, we saw a lot of people pay the thousand dollars for the smaller iPhone 10 last year. So I think for a hundred dollars more, especially the early adopters who want to upgrade from the iPhone 10, they're going to be looking towards the 10 Mac, 10s Max, given the 10s is not a significant update over the 10. Did anything surprise you today? Uh, I guess a few surprises were the lack of surprises, <laughs> right? I was thinking there would be more some hardware tweaks here and there, software enhancements on the iPhone, real differentiators last year, like an emojis were a year ago. Uh, portrait mode two years ago but turns out there wasn't there wasn't much else that Apple had up its sleeves today how big a deal do you think this watch upgrade is I mean people are really excited about it the FDA approval the heart tracking features it seems to you know some people are saying really realize the initial vision of what the Apple watch was supposed to be but that the first model didn't really deliver on right this is basically Apple bragging at this point their smartwatch prowess is so far ahead of the competition in terms of functionality user interface integration with other products that it's sort of laughable how how behind the rest of the industry is. And if you look at Fitbit's stock chart today, even their investors know how, how far behind Fitbit is at this point. What was missing from today? Missing uh, three or four key things. One, AirPods. They've been working on new AirPod models. Those things are so popular that they go well with the watch and the phone. They should have brought up the new ones they're working on. Uh, probably today. Um, new air power, the wireless charger, which can charge the AirPods, the watch, and the phone would have been a perfect complement for today. They haven't discussed it since exactly one year ago today at last year's iPhone 10 event. 
new iPads, biggest iPad upgrades since the iPad Pro came out a few years ago. Those are coming too, as well as new MacBook and Mac Mini. So a lot that Apple still has to reveal this year. Any mention of a trade war, which is looming over all of this? No, no, no mention from Apple today. They they got they got rid of that last <laughs> week with their comments. So, so uh, again, two hundred billion dollars in tariffs, uh, uh, two hundred billion dollars in products uh, potentially uh, getting new tariffs. Apple has said that'll impact the watch, that'll impact AirPods. But what we're really waiting for is if um, the president. President uh, levies another round of tariffs on this additional $267 billion worth of goods. Could that impact the iPhone? If it impacts the iPhone, I think the iPhone prices are so high at this point that over $1,000, I saw, I was looking on the on the store today, it's almost $1,500 if you want the highest capacity. It's actually $1,449. So maybe that's priced in a little bit because they did raise prices a little bit going on those higher capacities. Um, but it doesn't sound like there's going to be phone tariffs anytime imminently. Right. Well, we're continuing to watch the tweets. Um, you went inside and got a hands-on look. I want to take a, a look at, at Mark Gurman's review of the newest iPhones now. Jobs Theater at the Apple Park campus in Cupertino. This is the iPhone XS. Looks just like an iPhone X as expected, uh, but some of the new enhancements inside include an upgraded camera both on the hardware and the software side, in addition to a faster H12 processor. So it's going to be quite a bit speedier than last year's model. Starts at the same price, has some of these new wallpapers. You can press down on it. Overall, it's just like an iPhone X. Face ID, same general design, features, stainless steel casing. The big difference is that there's actually a bigger version now known as the 10S Max, which starts at $1,050 with a 6.5 inch screen. This one, the 10S, still has the same 5.8 inch screen. And there's also the iPhone 10R with a 6.1 inch screen, but aluminum around the sides instead of the stainless steel on this one. And this is the iPhone XS Max. This is the bigger one with a six and a half inch screen. That makes it quite a bit bigger than the iPhone X and XS and all past iPhone models. And the reason they're calling it the Max is it's quite a bit bigger than the Plus uh, screen size as well. So at 6.5 inches, the overall phone, because the edge edge screen is the same size as let's say a seven or an eight plus, but you have that much more screen real estate, about an inch more diagonally. And you can just see that websites and the interface um, is much bigger if you go side by side side, sort of like an iPad where you have some of your content on one side and the other content on the other side. Same camera, same chip system you have going on on this one uh, as you have going on with the iPhone XS as well. This one is 1050, comes in this white and silver color, the space gray, sort of darker color, as well as a new gold finish. This is the, the silver one. Uh, so that's the iPhone XS. It goes on sale September 21st in two sizes. And this is the lower cost one. This is the iPhone XR. It's a direct replacement for the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus from last year. $750, so it's sort of sandwiched in between on the pricing scale as well. 6.1 inch screen. The bezels are slightly thicker than they are on the iPhone XS and XS Max. It's an LCD screen, but to be honest, at first glance, it looks quite a bit similar. Uh, a little bit thicker than those devices. You have the metal edges instead of the stainless steel. This is a way for Apple to bring in the design of Face ID and no home button to more people, obviously because of the price, but it also comes in several new colors. It sort of looks like an iPhone 8 from the back right here with the glass back and the single lens camera and the LED flash below it and sort of the metal edges, but on the front, it really looks like an iPhone 10 because of the edge-to-edge -edge screen with Face ID. Mark Ehrman for Bloomberg News in Cupertino. Now I want to bring in Technolysis President and Chief Analyst Bob O'Donnell. You were also inside today. Um, we see Apple tripling down on this family of iPhones. Mark Gurman really played down the newness of these new devices. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, look, fundamentally, it was the things that they expected, people expected them to do, that the market really does want. They do want larger screen sizes and smaller screen sizes. It, it's about segmentation at this point, right? The market is already saturated. People are now looking for those special niches that they're gonna wanna fulfill. And Apple did do that in a couple of interesting ways. Obviously, the screen sizes is one of them, but also, let's not forget that for the China and Asia market, dual SIM support is a big deal. So that was important as well. Let's talk about dual SIM. So this is, you know, the addition of a electronic SIM card, which means you can change carriers more easily. Right. You don't have to put in a new SIM card. You can just do it in your settings. It also makes international travel very easy. Uh, the carriers potentially not too happy about this, but but why could this be so transformative? Well, it's it's really going to be much more transformative in other parts of the world than the U.S. I think we'll see with eSIM, theoretically, it's easier to change carriers, but 
it's not necessarily, you still have to, you know, make the call and do the changes. So there's some hassle involved. But in Asia and other markets, people literally have a work line and a personal line, and that's a big deal. So that's really important as well. So talk about the Apple Watch. A yep. lot of excitement about the watch. Um, you know, the, the FDA approval, the health tracking features, the heart monitoring features, an electric cardiogram on your wrist. How significant are these upgrades? I think they're really significant. And you mentioned it earlier, and I completely agree that we're now finally seeing the vision of the Apple Watch that I think people originally expected. You know, it's a health device. It is a wearable computer. It's much more than just a smartwatch. And I think that's the original vision that people had for the Apple Watch. They're only just now getting to that vision. So I think it's a big deal. Now, will it dramatically increase the sales of the device? We'll see, but it can be thought about differently now because now it's, it's a health tracking device, not just a fitness device and not just a smartwatch. And and, and it does things automatically in the machine learning side of it. To me, even though Mark revealed all the specs, <laughs> the one thing he wasn't able to necessarily do was reveal sort of this smartness and intelligence mm. of these devices. Um, you know, on the watch, you know, the automatic fall recognition and then making a phone call, things like that, as well as on the phone, the automatic recognition of uh, HDR, high definition, high resolution images, um, and the ability to do that dynamically with their neural net engine uh, and machine learning. All of that stuff was new, and it gave a little bit of a twist and a look forward to what I think we're going to expect from these kinds of devices. Can't put one of those on my kids because they'll be making a lot of phone calls. Yeah. Um, but that's my question. You know, when Face ID came out, it didn't work that well at first. People really had to get used to it. Do you think that's going to be the same case with the watch and these new features? Are they going to work as well as advertised? Well, obviously, the, the you know, the devil's in the details, and we'll see. But certainly, I think the idea is interesting. I do agree, though, the mainstream people who have not gone to an iPhone 10, getting used to the swipe and the lack of the home button, it's going to take some people a little bit of getting used to. But, I, you know, most people do adjust, and I think they'll adjust on this as well. So, you know, I think it's worth pointing out that this is it's such, the strategy is so different than it was uh, you know, eight, ten years ago, where it was all about one device, yes. one phone. Now you have all of these niches, and I'm curious, do you think there are too many niches? You know, I asked Mark earlier, are people going to buy the middle phone when you could just buy the cheap one or the big one? It's a great question, but look, if you think about it and you look at how people use their phones, I mean, I can look at my family and friends, I'm sure you could do the same. People do have different preferences, and let's not forget, Apple, of course, sells worldwide, and there's a lot of regional preferences. So what Apple has recognized is, look, we can't just do the one-size-fits-all uh, phenomenon anymore. We have to segment the market, create different products for these different segments, and that's the only way they can maintain the position that they're in. Because, look, overall smartphone market is not growing. So now it's about maintaining share, and that's what they're trying to do. And we can't forget, you've got the iPhone 7 still available in that $400 range. But as you said, competition is, is only getting more fierce. You've got a raft of competitors in China, and they are... They they are a lot cheaper. So how well poised do you think Apple is to um, tackle some of these growing and, and, and developing markets? Is it going to be more about customers upgrading or is it going to be about lowering new users? I, yeah, it's a great question. I think we are going to see a little bit of both. China, remember, they have a huge band of very strong uh, Apple followers um, and they love big phones. So the, the 10s Max with dual SIMs in China is going to be a huge hit, I'm mm -hmm. sure. But places like India, even 449 is way too expensive. And Apple's been struggling in India. Yeah, I mean, people sell phones there for under $100 or maybe $150 yeah. that are pretty well equipped. So that is going to be a challenge. But I think this is the, the world that we live in now. And mm -hmm. I think Apple knows that. And they're going to have to continue that segmentation. And just remember that not everything is geared for everybody. And they're going to target certain products to certain markets and, and then use other products in other markets. Well, they certainly have a huge family of devices now. Yes, Bob Daddle do. of Technolis is always great to have you here Thanks, on the show. Thanks for breaking it down. All right, up next, Tesla in the headline still. Another high-ranking executive said to be leaving the company. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. And if you like Bloomberg News, you can check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology live from Apple headquarters in Cupertino, California. I want to turn now to another big story for a moment. Yet another high-ranking finance executive at Tesla is leaving the company. According to our sources, Justin McInear, vice president of worldwide finance and operations, is parting ways with the electric car maker. We are now getting news also of longer delivery response times for cars. This was posted on Twitter. Due to a large increase in vehicle delivery volume in North America, Tesla customers may experience longer response times. Resolving this is our top priority. Here now to discuss from New York, we've got Tigers Financial Partners Chief Investment Officer Ivan Feinseth, also with us in New York, Max Chafkin of Bloomberg Business Week. Max, um, translate this longer response time situation and how serious it is. Hard to, actually hard to know exactly what he's talking about. My, my supposition, he's talking about basically people requesting service on their, on their cars. And what's happening now is Tesla, as we've been talking about for months, is in the middle of a, you know, sprint to get as many cars manufactured and then delivered to customers as possible. And so, you know, it feels like they're having some kind of normal, uh, you know, customer service snafu. So, so I don't know. Until we learn more, I wouldn't read too much into it. Although, I definitely want to start looking at what customers are saying. And I haven't had a chance to do that yet. So perhaps more serious, Ivan, is this continued executive turnover, and now specifically in the finance department, we, we had the, the chief counting, uh, accounting officer leave, um, as well as other finance executives, and now yet another. How concerning is it that um, Tesla can't keep people in these very important positions as this company is working towards profitability? Well, it's never good to have turnover, especially of key executives. However, I do believe there's a long line of people who would love to work at Tesla. I don't think they are going to have a hard time replacing anybody that's leaving any of these positions. The opportunity to still get in on what is the ground floor of a, a, a company that is you know, making huge changes to the automobile industry, and that is very appealing to people who are in Silicon Valley and a lot of companies do have high turnover. People in Silicon Valley tend to look for the next big opportunity. So uh, the turnover is never good, but I think there's opportunity to fill the positions pretty easily. Well, and this is extremely high turnover. Of course, we are focused on it. Max, you know, we've got an entire Bloomberg team, you know, trying to talk to current and former Tesla employees. What are employees leaving? What are they saying? I mean, I think what's what's happening now, uh, what's been happening for the past few weeks, I, I, I would think would be extremely uh, demotivating to many Tesla employees. I mean, you have people who have been basically working around the clock. I mean, including Elon Musk, uh, you know, d at least during some days. Um, and, and while that's going on, you have this kind of whole drama that feels like something close to self-sabotage. So while I think that Ivan's right, that, you know, sure, they're going to be able to hire people. Um, this is a company, obviously, with a lot of growth potential ahead of it, there is the problem of like, you know, when you have a lot of turnover, it, it saps productivity. And when you have these kind of self-inflicted wounds, these distractions, that also saps productivity. And this is a company that can't really afford that right now. They are trying to work as fast as they can to get these cars out the door. Meantime, Ivan, we heard Gwen Chotwell, the, the COO of SpaceX, Elon's other company, um, uh, comment on, on what she believes Elon to be as, as capable and lucid as he's ever been. She wishes people wouldn't uh, focus on the trivialities. What to you, as, as someone who is analyzing this company, what are the trivialities and, and what of all uh, the news that has made, made headlines in the last several weeks, what matters? What matters when it comes to your evaluation of the capability of Elon Musk and uh, the potential of Tesla? Well, the, the recent events surrounding Elon have been pretty shocking. However, the focus is still on the car. I don't really believe that anybody in a Tesla showroom considering purchasing a Tesla is really thinking about what Elon is doing. They're thinking about if they like the car, and the car has a lot of appeal. I mean, the interest in the car is still very high. They have a long pipeline of people who want Model 3s. So I don't really know if it affects the key thing, which is the sale of the vehicles. Max, is that the case? Or, or are there qu customers out there who might be questioning 
Is, is my car safe? Am I going to be able to buy another one of these in, in three years? So I, I, two things. One is I think the sort of legacy Tesla customer, the people who bought the Roadster, which was the super fast sports car, and the Model S, which was their sort of high-end sedan, you know, those people aren't turned off by Elon Musk going on a podcast and, and using some, you know, uh, drugs. Um, but I do think as this company tries to make, you know, a quote-unquote mass market car, you know, an electric Toyota Corolla or whatever, you know, Toyota Corolla buyers, you know, don't care about cool. They want a car that is safe and reliable. So I do think there is a there's some long-term risk, you know, if if the company isn't able to get its sort of image under control. The other thing is this is a situation where you have a lot of little cuts. And if if they're able to get things turned around, if they have a good quarter, if if, you know, Elon keeps things relatively buttoned up on Twitter for a while, I think this kind of dies down and maybe we go back to business as usual. But if there's another problem say some kind of accident at the factory or a driverless car situation we've seen a couple of those before or you know who knows what that could kind of start to pile on and create a narrative that would be you know bad for Tesla Meantime, Ivan, Tesla is remotely extending the life of some car batteries as Hurricane Florence encroaches on the East Coast. Is this just good PR? Is this significant? And if it is significant, why can't they do this for everyone? Well, uh, see, the way that they continue to upgrade and increase the serviceability is to download software and firmware upgrades from the satellite. So I think that they probably will do this once they find that they do have the capability to do this. Now, um, the software can control actually how much electricity is being drawn by the motor. So if there's a way of extending that part of it, they can extend the battery life, which this process may be a recent breakthrough that they are just starting to uh, put out as an upgrade cycle. So they, are, they do keep upgrading the cars through upgrading the software. So, Max, walk us through the milestones that you and we are going to be charting through the rest of the year. So, we're going to have, you know, more, you know, another quarter coming up, and and we'll we're going to see, you know, whether this company is on pace in terms of their production and also in terms of, you know, profits and losses. Like they've been they've been doing all these all these sort of um, kind of uh, very aggressive maneuvers to cut costs. So, so we, we want to look at that. Um, the 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 other thing that I think is is coming. Up and this is a little bit further out is going to be the launch of the Model Y. Now, when Tesla introduced, you know, the Model Three, the most recent car, there was huge interest. You know, orders were through the roof. You know, Elon's going to get out there at some point early next year, uh, unveil this new electric SUV, a, a sort of compact SUV, and we'll see if our customers going to reserve that thing in the same numbers that they reserved the Model Three. Okay. And if that happens, I think that's a good sign. All right, Max Chafkin, Bloomberg Business Week, Ivan Feinseth, Chief Financial Officer, Tigris Financial Partners. Thank you both. More of the special edition of Bloomberg Technology from Apple Headquarters. Up next, this is Bloomberg. The European Parliament has dealt a blow to Google and Facebook. Lawmakers voted to back copyright rules that would help video, music, and other content rights holders seek payment for use of their work online. More of the special edition of Bloomberg Tech coming up. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Back to our Apple coverage today's annual product event revealed new phones and significant changes to the Apple Watch. The company delivered what was expected phone wise, tripling down on its upgrades to the iPhone 10 with the 10s, 10x Max, the 10R. But audiences were most surprised by the new Apple Watch Series 4 with more health features than ever before, including first of its kind FDA approval. Here to tell us more about the watch and all creative strategy analyst Carolina. Milanese, we were talking about the watch in the break. Mm -hmm. you, you think it really is a big deal and, and could bring in, in new customers and per perhaps some of the skeptics. Why? Absolutely. I think that the redesign and how um, just the face is now different because the complications can be richer and the experience is a bit more uh, powerful, but it can be also simple. I think might get some people excited. I think the smart idea to keep the third generation in the portfolio at 279 
$99 if people that tried it, but then are like, eh, maybe it's not for me yet. Or people that have been waiting, that is a much more affordable, kind of dip your toes in the water uh, move. And then I think obviously the, the health side of things is important. You know, how long is it gonna be before we can actually get our insurance to pay for it? So, you know, I know a lot of people who got the first generation of the Apple Watch wore it for a few weeks and just yeah. tossed it aside because they, they felt they didn't need it. They had their phone. Um, can those people be convinced that this is enough to have a completely different experience? I think I always said from the very beginning that you need to put some time into the watch to really understand what the watch can do for you. Um, it does take an investment. It does. Of time Absolutely. and energy. Yes, it does. Not everyone has. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but we are at a time where uh, people are trying to disconnect from the phone mm -hmm. and and I think the watch helps you because it you know if you're a control freak like I am <laughs> I want to know what's going on but I don't want to get sucked into my phone you know you look at one tweet and then 40 minutes later you're still looking at your <laughs> screen I think watch helps you with that and is you know is a good uh, cutting the cord but still being connected so how do you evaluate the the breadth of the phones that Apple has now all the way down to the iPhone 7 and in, in that $400 range up to the you know 10s max um, for $1,100 how well do you think this positions Apple going into the holiday season I think it's the strong lineup for Apple for sure um, of course different countries have different price points and $450 for an iPhone 7 is not cheap in India. Right. Uh, but I think that is the first time that you have that breadth from 450 to 1100 for the basic models and a little bit of everything from a form factor perspective as well. Uh, you know, last year when the 10 came out, people appreciated more screen, but if you were on a plus model before, it did feel strange in your hand. You, you missed that large form factor which is I think what the max will address this year and then you have the DR that is a new attempt that Apple uh, is taking to the more affordable price point and I think a smart one too do you think the 10R though could cannibalize sales of some of the higher-end phones well, you know, Apple always says that as long as they buy Apple, they don't really mind. I think it's quite differentiated from, from a, a standpoint of feature set and uh, the colors itself, uh, you know, so that, that consumers will go towards one or the other. But I think what is important is that it doesn't matter which one of the 10 you buy. Apple is selling you the next generation experience when it comes to iPhone. So they'll be happy either one. So what do you think are the biggest risks ahead for Apple? For what Apple? Are the, what are the roadblocks? I mean, we didn't see shares react particularly well. You know, they don't always have much of a reaction at all on these product announcement days. But, you know, it, the company's already at a trillion dollars. They're already on top of the world. Is, is, is up the only way to go? Or, or could there be another direction? <laughs> well, I, I think that there's obviously a lot of attention on their services side, and, and this is what else they've done today with the, with the different models, you know, the larger screens, whenever we're gonna see the TV service, obviously play to that. Uh, and uh, maybe the other part of the, what people are paying attention is China and the economic and the political situation with China. But you saw today how much China means to Apple and and the fact that they came out with a dual SIM model that has two physical SIMs when the rest of the world will have an eSIM. If these tariffs do materialize on the, the $200 billion, Apple's already said prices will go up, um, there could be an additional uh, set of tariffs on $267 billion more worth of goods. How much is that going to hurt Apple? Well, it's going to hurt Apple more than it would Samsung, which is the other big name right in the U.S. market for smartphone because they don't have to get caught into this U.S. versus China battle. Uh, but there are other ways. First of all, not always Apple will have to pass on those tariffs to the final consumers. But it's not as simple as saying, oh, bring it all in, in America and build it here because the cost will be even higher. All right, Carolina Milanese, Creative Strategies. Great to have you back Pleasure. here on the show. Thanks for sharing your perspective. All right, well, investors, as we discussed, seem sort of unconvinced about this new suite of iPhones and Apple Watches. Shares finished the session 1.24% lower and we're mostly down throughout the day here at the Steve Jobs Theater. For more on this, we're joined on the phone by Cross Research Managing Director Shannon Cross. So, so Shannon, why do you think the shares reacted this way? 
Well, look, I think, you know, the stock has been relatively strong through, um, you know, since earnings. And, and I think that a lot of what they announced were was sort of in line with people's expectations. I do think that there'll be some uh, sort of digesting of what it means from an ASP perspective from what they announced. Um, basically, based on our estimates, we think that there's probably about a 10 percent potential for a 10 percent year of year increase in ASP, which is significant given, you know, how ASPs increased this prior year. So, you know, they're definitely mixed shifting up. And whereas there was a lot of questions about their ability to do it last year when they launched the iPhone 10, I think at this point they've, they have significant experience to know what the market will take and will absorb. So I feel much more confident with the pricey moves that they made today. ASP, the average selling price of the iPhone, $724 last quarter. Uh, there's an expectation it could go up to uh, potentially as high as $793. Um, we spoke to Pierre Farragou of, of New Street Research. They've got the loan sell rating on Apple. And his view is that um, the iPhone 10 has done so well so far that there's not a lot of room for more upgrades at this point, and, and, and it means that next year, in their view, will be a disappointment. What do you think about that theory? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting from an Apple perspective is that their installed base has grown double digits the last several years on an annual basis. So they've got a significantly large installed base with which to try to target. Um, you know, I think the $749 phone will be very attractive to a large number of those players, but, you know, uh, based on our research and conversations with people, you know, clearly China likes the newest and greatest and big. So, you know, that will help with the Mac. Um, and, you know, I think that, again, there's there's a group of people who are on this sort of every year cycle that, that will go out and buy the, the latest one. Um, so I'm, I'm not thinking that, you know, they sort of, I don't know, ex exhausted the potential pool of iPhone 10 purchasers. With what they did last year, clearly it surprised, I think, both them and, and the street in terms of, you know, how iPhone 10 didn't fall off. But I think that also gives them a lot of uh, support to the fact that, you know, they could go to, what is it, one, uh, you know, almost $1,100 for the, the high-end phone. And, you know, I think they'll, they'll get it. Will it be a huge percentage of sales? No, maybe not necessarily. But I think the combination of the um, two OLED devices will, will sell very well. The OLED devices, the 10s and the 10s Max. Right. Uh, talk to us about what you see happening in in other international markets. China obviously sells a lot of iPhones, but it's complicated given what's going on with the administration. Uh, Apple has been struggling in India, where the price of the cheapest iPhone is still very high. And then you have all of these other developing markets. Well, I, you know, look, I think one of the things that Apple did last year and that they've, con you know, continued to do this year is that they're keeping a very wide product set. So they're going to have the S 6S out in some markets, which will be priced under $400, which gets very attractive, you know, in a lot of these markets. Maybe not India, but, you know, with the mass market. But in, you know, China and other areas, I think it's it's a good price point. And then, you know, obviously you run all the way up to the high end. So it kind of depends. I think Europe is a bit more price sensitive than the U.S., certainly. Um, Japan tends to like a smaller form factor. So that would be more like the iPhone 10s, or you know, perhaps maybe some of the smaller phones. I, it just, you know, it, it really I think has become some somewhat bifurcated by market for Apple. Um, but I, again, the important thing is that they do have all of these products to target all the various price points and bands that they need to. Um, so, you know, again, I think you know, when you look at the competition, you look at where Apple's at, and you look at the recurring nature of the hardware purchases that they, they have. I mean, once you get into the ecosystem, you tend to stay. Um, I think it bodes well for uh, iPhone sales in 2000, their fiscal 2019, which would start um, right now. All right. Cross Research Managing Director Shannon Cross with us on the phone. Shannon, thanks so much for calling in. Coming up. Apple's new virtual SIM cars. Just how will phone service carriers handle a SIMless world? That is next. And later in the show, we'll wrap up Apple's big day and tell you how the tech world reacted to Tim Cook's latest announcements. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from Apple headquarters in Cupertino. We are continuing our look at Apple's big product launch. One significant feature announced today for the iPhone XS and XS Max, dual SIM cards and a new electronic 
SIM. Basically, eSIM means you don't need to physically insert a chip into the phone. Instead, you have to change the phone setting to theoretically change carriers. This new feature has one big fan already, at least so he says. T-Mobile CEO John Ledger tweeted, I love that Apple is offering dual and eSIM in the new phones. It makes it easier to try and move between carriers, which is fine with me because everyone wants to switch to T-Mobile. Joining me now from San Francisco to discuss our Bloomberg Tech editor, Alistair Barr. So perhaps just a little bit of sarcasm there, Allie, from John Ledger. What will this really mean for carriers like T-Mobile? I think John hit it on the head, actually. It's going to be really bad news for U.S. carriers because it's going to make it a lot easier to switch between, switch between carriers. And, and actually, Verizon and AT&T have been fighting this for a couple of years. And, and about a year ago, Apple actually wrote some letters to US regulators complaining about Verizon and AT&T digging their heels in over this. So, so really, the US carriers really, really hate this. And it's bad news for them. Uh, right, which is why uh, there was a suspicion this was coming, but perhaps not this soon. You know, Apple says it's got um, partnerships worked out with carriers all around the world. What does this mean if you're not living in the United States? So in the U.S., uh, there looks to be some um, specific limitations on it. If you're in China, actually, the eSIM technology is, is not going to be there at all. Uh, so Apple has actually had to tweak their um, the iPhone XS for China and it's going to have a SIM slot with spaces for two physical cards and, and that's in, that's important because there's going to be there's going to be a lot a lot fewer benefits from that um, Apple hasn't really said why, why that is the case however um, last year the Apple watch came out um, with eSIM technology in China and um, the, the national carrier Unicom that was providing that support abruptly switched it off after about three days in China. Does this mean, Alistair, that if you're a T-Mobile user or a Verizon user, you might not say so? You might instead say, I'm an iPhone user. I'm a Samsung user. Yeah, certainly uh, the, the, some of the big strategy successes that, that big U.S. technology companies have had over the years is, is basically taking away everyone else's brand and overlaying their brand on, on top. So, so um, yeah, uh, U.S. wireless service could be pretty, pretty commoditized by this type of technology. Um, and obviously, the iPhone brand is, is, is a very big deal. Um, s smaller carriers like T-Mobile probably like it because they're, they're, they're used to competing on, on price. And uh, I think there's just going to be more of that in the U.S. All right. Bloomberg's Alistair Barr in San Francisco. Thanks so much um, for sharing that side of the story. Coming up next, we're going to take one last look at Apple's new line of products and talk about the Apple of the future with a veteran. That's next. This is Bloomberg. The longtime executive producer of CBS's 60 Minutes is out. The network says Jeff Fager violated company policy, but didn't say much more than that. According to CBS, today's action is not directly related to allegations of sexual misconduct, which recently surfaced in the press and are still being investigated independently. We are wrapping our look at Apple's big product launch here at headquarters in Cupertino. While there were few surprises this year, Apple is, as expected, tripling down on the iPhone, including its first six and a half inch screen smartphone. The phones are continuing the trend of Apple steadily raising prices rather than necessarily focusing on luring in mil millions of new iPhone users. Uh, one place perhaps where Apple might lure those new users is the Apple Watch as it looks to turn it into a healthcare device. It got its first uh, of a kind FDA approval as well as new health sensors and an electrocardiogram app to monitor your heart. So just what can we make of Apple's big day here? For that, I want to bring in O'Malley, partner at True Ventures. And I'm so glad you're here with us because you've been to so many of these events in your life. How do you think about how these events have evolved from, you know, the days when Steve Jobs was very much large and in charge? Um, interesting times for the company. Mm -hmm. You see more influencers, more video, video, uh, 
videographers, videographers models, video actors, models. and actresses. Yeah, and so I think it shows that the company is a much more mainstream brand than it was even in Steve Jobs' day. So definitely signs of a trillion dollar company. I think uh, what has changed is the, the ruthless editing of the products is gone. The eclectic marketing of the products is gone. Mm. We see a lot of gloss, we see a lot of sheen, but we don't see the simplicity of marketing and honest message you would get during the days of... So is that not a good thing? Or is it because you're reaching a more diverse set of customers? I don't know, but I think iPhone XS Max, Steve would have not allowed that. Yeah. Like, I think that was, that's the problem with Apple right now, is that they have to come up with marketing their products in a way that it appeals to everybody and not just to a few people. So again, signs of a trillion dollar company with trillion dollar problems. Tim Cook on stage talked about the scale of iOS, the scale of, of Apple today. Um, take a listen uh, to this that he had to say. Hey, iOS is not just the world's most advanced mobile operating system, it's the most personal. We're about to hit a major milestone. We are about to ship our two billionth iOS device. <laughs> Two billion, he says, iOS devices mm -hmm. out there now. How much room is there for growth with all of these niches? Uh, they have to come up with new products. Mm -hmm. I think, as we've seen with the watch, I think they come up with products. It takes a little bit longer for those products to become many billion dollar businesses. And so they have definitely challenges to find new niches and grow, but I think they can. Like, I mean, we've seen the AirPods go from being like an ugly curiosity to being a mainstream head product and that other people are copying it now. So I think you've seen that with the watch as well. So you'll see them keep trying all these new ideas. You see the core of the company is still very strong. The core of the company, which is ruthlessly focused on hardware and inside the device innovation is very strong. That hasn't changed and probably gotten better since Steve's days. They have invested ruthlessly in chips and other technologies. They've done a great job of that. You see that is the ultimate gift of Steve Jobs. I think that's the last thing he did for this company to put them on the safe track of building great products. We saw them showcase new apps in there, a new generation of apps, uh, new AR features. AR, um, we expect, could be perhaps the next big platform for Apple. Does that make for a completely different experience, or is it just um, an, an, an improved experience? I think it's an, it's, this is a great next step, but I don't, my main point, main takeaway from this event, this company is struggling to market itself mm. properly. You look at the watch, they are pushing, you know, the uh, ECG mm. and the fall features. They're not for young people, but the ads are all about young people <laughs> running and biking and doing all those things with the, mm. with the watch. And I mean, just like, wait, who's in charge here? Mm -hmm. Like, because that's an old people's product feature, right? Like, I have a heart disease. Mm. I'm, I'm older, mm. and I think that makes sense for me. But how does it make sense for a 25-year-old? And I think that's where the marketing challenges are showing up for this company. I think if we were to focus on what is the problem for Apple, that would be how do you tell your story going forward? I think they, we've seen they can build great products, and they will continue to build great products. How will they tell the story now that you can't tell the difference between X and XS? Like, like why do I care? Like, why should my mom care? Why should my friends care? Mm. And I think they need to make people care more about their products. It's a marketing challenge for a company which is, throughout its history, has been great about marketing. Right, and spent so much time thinking about how they tell uh, the story. It's Tim Cook's seventh year at the helm of Apple. You talk about a company with trillion dollar problems. What do you think the next seven years of Apple and Tim Cook's leadership look like? I think if Tim Cook did what he's been doing, that's pretty good. Like, I don't think we should ask for more from a CEO. He's a decent human being. He looks people, looks after his people. He's looking after the legacy of the company. He's returned so much shareholder value. He has done 
right by its customers, which is you and I, by not selling our data to somebody else. He as understands that at a humanistic level, this company has a moral obligation. I think he's a great CEO. He should be doing this for another five years at the very least. What about the company? I, you know, if I was that smart about forecasting the future, I would be running one, right? So, um, do you think the next big innovation for Apple is it these health features? Is it AR? Like, what is the big platform that you can watch? I, you know, see, this is the problem. Mm. Like, the big innovation was inside mm. the, the the phone, the A12 Bionic chip. That's the best chip for smartphones or any other computing platform right now. They built a beautiful internals of this device, and we. How do you tell that story? Right. So I think that's they are pushing the envelope. Look at what they've done with the with the device. The hardware of the watch inside mm -hmm. is beautiful. And it's how do you go and tell this to people? And how how do you make people care for it? You All know, right. I think maybe those influencers will. <laughs> Just watch Instagram. All right, yeah. a new family of iPhones, new Apple watches. Oh, Malik of True Ventures. Always great to have your thoughtful views here on our show. Thank, Thank you. you. And that does it for this special edition of Bloomberg Technology from Apple headquarters in Cupertino. Tomorrow's show, we got a big one. Starbucks CEO Kevin Johnson will be speaking at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. I'll be sitting down with him. Do not miss that conversation. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.